Ready to swap your smartphone for a calculator and dust off your best disco moves? Aha! Uh -huh. We're taking a deep dive into the world of inventory management circa 1980. That's right, we're traveling back to an era of landline phones, paper purchase orders, and inventory counts done entirely by hand. Imagine the scene, rows of towering shelves, clipboards in hand, and not a spreadsheet in sight. We're cracking open a fascinating time capsule today. Oh, I like that. A final report analyzing the inventory management clerk position at what appears to be a chain of retail centers back in the day. It's a glimpse into a world before e-commerce and instant data, where managing inventory was as much about intuition and experience as it was about hard numbers. And as we'll discover, many of the challenges they faced back then still resonate with businesses today. For sure. So what was the goal with this report? Right. Why did someone decide to analyze the inventory management clerk role in such detail? It seems like someone in upper management was feeling the pain of inventory woes, which, let's be honest, is a tale as old as time. They were likely experiencing the classic symptoms too much of some products, not enough of others, and a constant scramble to keep up. This report was their attempt to understand the root causes of these issues. Makes sense. Yeah. They probably figured, let's zoom in on the folks on the front lines of invent the inventory management clerks and see what's really going on. Exactly. And the report dives into three main areas. How inventory was counted, how new products were ordered, and the overall approach to inventory control. But before we unpack their findings, let's set the stage. Imagine you're an inventory management clerk in 1980. Can you picture what your day-to-day -day might have looked like? I'm picturing mountains of paperwork, endless phone calls, and probably a lot of frantic calculator tapping. You're not far off. Oh, okay. Eight physical inventory counts where you'd spend days meticulously tallying every single item in the stock room. Yeah. Purchase orders would involve carbon copies and snail mail. And forget about instant updates on delivery times or stock levels. Wow, talk about a logistical tightrope walk. Every decision must have felt so much more weighty without the safety net of real-time data. Absolutely, and that's where this deep dive gets interesting. It wasn't just the manual processes that were different back then. It was the entire mindset around inventory management. Okay, so what were they doing differently back then? Well, one of the first things the report highlights is a significant knowledge gap among the inventory management clerks. Like they didn't have all the fancy software we have today to crunch numbers and forecast demand. Exactly. For example, the report mentions something called the economic order quantity or EOQ. This is a fundamental concept in inventory management that helps businesses determine the optimal quantity of inventory to order at a time to minimize costs. So it's all about finding that sweet spot between having enough stock on hand to meet demand, but not so much that you're stuck with a warehouse full of unsold products. Precisely. Oh. But the report found that many inventory clerks weren't familiar with this concept or how to apply it effectively. They were also making mistakes when it came to calculating things like needs periods. Needs periods, what are those? Think of it this way. A needs period is the amount of time it takes to receive new inventory after placing an order. So if you know it takes two weeks for a product to arrive from your supplier and you sell 10 units per week, your needs period would need to factor in those two weeks, plus a buffer for any unexpected delays or surges in demand. I see. So you don't get caught with your pants down when a product suddenly flies off the shelves. Exactly. But the report revealed that many inventory clerks weren't consistently accounting for things like seasonal spikes in demand, vendor lead times, or even the impact of their company's marketing plans. This led to situations where they were constantly playing catch-up, scrambling to reorder products that were already out of stock. So they were missing some key ingredients in their inventory management recipe. But was this just a case of a few individuals needing more training? Or was there something bigger at play here? That's the million-dollar question and what makes this report so fascinating. It goes beyond simply identifying individual knowledge gaps and points to deeper systemic issues within the organization. Okay, I'm intrigued. What kind of systemic issues are we talking about? Well, think about it. These inventory management clerks weren't operating in a vacuum. They were part of a larger ecosystem reporting to managers, relying on communication from other departments, and working within a company culture that either supported or hindered their success. So it's like that saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. But in this case, maybe the weakest link wasn't the individual employees, but the system itself. Exactly. And the report highlights three major areas where the system was failing. 
First up, it points to a lack of training for the center managers themselves. Remember, these were likely the folks overseeing the inventory management clerks, making decisions about staffing, and ultimately responsible for their store's inventory performance. It's like expecting someone to bake a cake without giving them the recipe or even telling them how to use an oven. Precisely. And the report found that many of these center managers were thrown into these inventory-related decisions with little to no formal training. They often lacked a deep understanding of the concepts we've been discussing, things like EOQ, needs periods, and how to forecast demand effectively. So you've got these inventory management clerks struggling with knowledge gaps, and they're reporting to managers who are equally in the dark. It's a recipe for disaster. Exactly. And this leads us to the second systemic issue identified in the report, a system that incentivized short-term gains over long-term inventory health. Okay, so spill the tea on that one. What did that look like in practice? Imagine you're a center manager and a big sale is coming up. You know you need all hands on deck to handle the influx of customers, but your inventory management clerk is swamped with uh, trying to get a handle on stock levels and place orders for upcoming weeks. What do you do? In a perfect world, you'd have enough staff to handle both, but I'm guessing that wasn't always the reality in 1980. You're right. Resources were often tight. So the center manager might be tempted to pull the inventory clerk away from their core duties and throw them on the sales floor to help with the immediate rush. Ah, uh, the classic short-term versus long-term dilemma. Sure, you might get through the sale without a hitch, but what happens afterward? Exactly. The report found that this kind of short-term thinking was rampant. It might have seemed like the best solution at the time, but it ultimately contributed to ongoing inventory issues. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. Okay, what was the third culprit they identified? This one is all about mindset. The report argues that back then, many in the organization were stuck in a maintaining stock mentality rather than strategically managing inventory. Hmm, those sound kind of similar to me. What's the difference? Yeah. Maintaining stock is reactive. It's about placing orders when you run low and hoping for the best. Managing inventory, on the other hand, is proactive, strategic, and, dare I say it, a bit more elegant. It's about understanding your supply chain, forecasting demand, optimizing inventory levels, minimizing waste, and ultimately ensuring you have the right products at the right time to meet customer needs. So it's like the difference between treading water to stay afloat and actually swimming toward a destination. Exactly. And while we might have more sophisticated tools and technologies at our disposal today, this shift in mindset from simply maintaining to strategically managing inventory remains just as relevant for modern businesses. I'm starting to see how these systemic issues, the lack of training, the short-term thinking, and the reactive mindset all tie together to create a perfect storm for inventory management headaches. Right. It's not enough to just focus on individual performance or blame the person placing the orders. Effective inventory management requires a holistic approach, one that addresses these underlying systemic issues. It's a good reminder that even in a world of algorithms and instant data, the human element, how we communicate, how we set priorities, and the mindsets we bring to the table continues to play a crucial role. Speaking of the human element, I hear this report wasn't all dry analysis and numbers. It even included some colorful anecdotes from the front lines. It does. In fact, one of the most striking findings comes from quotes taken directly from high-performing inventory management clerks. These were individuals who despite the systemic challenges, we're excelling in their roles. Okay, I'm ready for some vintage wisdom from the inventory trenches. What did these all-star clerks have to say? One quote in particular jumped out at me. One clerk stated, if you're truly managing your inventory, you're always going to be out of something. Wait, really? That almost sounds counterintuitive. Shouldn't the goal be to never run out of stock? That's what's so insightful about this quote. It speaks to the delicate balancing act that is inventory management. This clerk understood that striving for 100% in stock all the time can be a recipe for bloated inventory, increased costs, and ultimately reduced profitability. So it's about finding that sweet spot, having enough product to meet demand while minimizing waste and maximizing efficiency. Precisely. And that balancing act remains a core challenge for businesses today, even with all our advanced forecasting tools and data analytics. This quote is a powerful reminder that sometimes the most valuable insights come from those who are closest to the action, those grappling with the day-to-day -day realities of keeping shelves stocked and customers happy. It's a good reminder that sometimes a little bit of strategic out of stock can be a good thing. But I'm curious, what do they have to say about the products that just wouldn't sell, the ones gathering dust on the back shelves? Ah, uh, yes. 
The report dedicates a significant portion to the issue of dog inventory, which stands for dead or dying. Dodgy inventory has a nice ring to it, but I'm guessing it wasn't a cuddly topic for these retail centers. Not at all. They recognized that DOG inventory was a major drain on resources, tying up valuable capital and taking up space that could be used for more profitable products. They called it out as a persistent problem. Every retailer's nightmare. I imagine those 1980 stock rooms had their fair share of forgotten fads and products that just never quite caught on. What did they recommend doing about it? One of the key problems they identified was a lack of consequences for those center managers who resisted marking down these slow-moving items. That makes sense. No one likes to admit defeat, especially when it comes to products they might have personally championed. But holding on to dead inventory helps no one. Exactly. The report highlighted the need for systems that encourage or even incentivize managers to address DOG inventory proactively. Remember, this was a time before widespread online marketplaces and discount retailers. So they had to get a bit more creative with their clearance sales and in-store promotions. It makes you appreciate the tools and options businesses have today for dealing with slow-moving inventory. Absolutely. But beyond the specifics of markdowns, this issue speaks to a larger theme that runs throughout the report, the importance of aligning incentives with desired behaviors. So it's not enough to just tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. You need to create a system that rewards the right actions. Precisely. And this principle extends far beyond just inventory management. It's a fundamental principle for effective management and organizational design in any era. It makes you think, what other doggy inventory might be lurking in modern businesses? Right. Outdated processes, inefficient technologies, or even just old ways of thinking that are holding them back. That's a fantastic point. It's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and lose sight of the bigger picture. Exactly. Sometimes you need to take a step back, dust off the cobwebs, and ask yourself, What's holding us back? What needs to be marked down, cleared out, or maybe even completely reimagined to make room for growth and innovation? Now you're thinking like a true inventory management guru. Laughs. Well, I'm learning from the best. And speaking of learning, there's another key takeaway from this report that I think is particularly relevant for our modern business landscape. I'm all ears. The report emphasizes the critical importance of communication or rather, the dangers of miscommunication and information silos. Okay, so how is communication causing problems in the world of 1980s inventory management? They found that there was often a disconnect between the people on the front lines, those handling the products, processing orders, and interacting with customers, and the folks making the inventory decisions. So the people who had the best understanding of what was actually selling and what wasn't weren't always being heard by the people placing the orders. Exactly. The report gives examples of staff having valuable insights about inventory needs, seasonal trends, or even defective products. But there was no formal mechanism for getting that information to the inventory clerk or the center manager in a timely manner. Oh, I can see how that would lead to problems. Sales might know a product is flying off the shelves, but if that information isn't reaching the person placing the orders, chaos reigns. Exactly. And on the flip side, the report also highlights instances where crucial information about upcoming promotions, changes in vendor lead times, or even company-wide inventory goals weren't effectively communicated to the inventory management clerks. So it's like they were trying to conduct an orchestra. Without a conductor, everyone playing their instruments, but without a shared understanding of the tempo or the tune. That's a great analogy, and it underscores a challenge that's arguably even more pronounced in today's increasingly complex and interconnected business world. Especially with remote teams, global supply chains, and information overload coming from all directions. Exactly. If anything, the need for clear, concise, and timely communication has only intensified since 1980. It makes you appreciate the tools we have today, from project management software and instant messaging platforms to good old-fashioned video conferencing that allow for more seamless collaboration and information sharing. Absolutely. But it also highlights the importance of using these tools effectively and fostering a culture of open communication at all levels of an organization. Because even the most sophisticated technology can't replace the value of clear communication and a shared understanding of goals. Couldn't have said it better myself. So we've got knowledge gaps, misaligned incentives, communication breakdowns. It sounds like the retail landscape of 1980 was a minefield of inventory management challenges. Yeah. But I can't help but notice a recurring theme here. These are all challenges that modern businesses still grapple with today. 
You're absolutely right. It's tempting to look back at these historical examples and think, oh, how quaint. We've come so far with our fancy technology and data-driven approaches. But as this report so vividly illustrates, many of the fundamental challenges of inventory management transcend time and technology. It's like that old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Exactly. And as we delve into the final key takeaways from this report, I think you'll be even more struck by the parallels between the inventory struggles of 1980 and the challenges facing businesses today. Okay, I'm ready to hear more. So we've uncovered these like timeless inventory management challenges, but this report was supposed to be about the inventory management clerk role, right? What's the connection to everything we've been discussing? That's where this deep dive gets really interesting. While the report focuses on the inventory management clerk, it inadvertently reveals a lot about the larger organizational culture surrounding inventory management back in 1980. Okay, I'm intrigued. Break it down for me. Think back to those systemic issues we've discussed. The lack of training, the focus on short-term gains, the siloed communication. These problems rarely originate at the individual employee level. You're saying these issues are symptoms of a larger problem. Exactly. This report, perhaps unintentionally, provides a glimpse into the leadership and decision-making dynamics at play within this company. So what can we infer about the company's leadership from this 1980 snapshot? It prompts us to ask some tough questions. Were they even aware of the knowledge gaps and the impact on inventory performance? Did they prioritize investing in training and development for their center managers? Was there a system in place to track inventory metrics and hold people accountable for results? Were they even measuring the right things? I mean, what good is a system that prioritizes a manager clearing out the stockroom for a big sale if it means neglecting essential inventory management tasks for weeks afterward. That's a crucial point. This report makes you wonder if they were truly measuring long-term inventory health or simply focused on short-term wins. Did they have clear communication channels for inventory-related information to flow between departments? It makes you wonder if those high-performing inventory management clerks, the ones who were excelling despite the challenges, were being recognized for their efforts, or if their insights were even being heard by those in charge. Precisely. And this brings us to a crucial insight. Effective inventory management isn't just about having the right software or the most sophisticated forecasting tools. It's about cultivating an organizational culture that values strategic inventory management from the top down. It's about leadership recognizing that inventory management isn't just a back office function. It's a strategic lever that can make or break a business's success. Exactly. And that's a message that resonates just as strongly today as it did back in 1980. If anything, in today's world of global supply chains, e-commerce, and increasingly complex customer demands, the stakes of effective inventory management have only gotten higher. Absolutely. This report has given me a whole new appreciation for the complexities of inventory management and the importance of getting it right. Me too. It's been a fascinating journey back in time, but also a powerful reminder that while the tools and technologies may change, the fundamental principles of effective inventory management remain remarkably consistent. So as we wrap up this deep dive into the world of 1980s inventory management, what's the key takeaway for our listeners, whether they're seasoned supply chain professionals or just trying to keep their own closets organized? I think the most important lesson is this. Effective inventory management is a team sport. It requires a shared understanding of goals, clear communication, and a commitment to continuous improvement at all levels of an organization. It's about recognizing that the decisions made today, whether it's about training, incentives, or communication structures, will have a ripple effect on a company's inventory health for weeks, months, even years to come. It's a reminder that we can learn as much from studying the successes and struggles of the past as we can from embracing the latest and greatest technologies. Couldn't agree more. Sometimes the most valuable insights are found not in the newest algorithms, but in the time-tested wisdom of those who came before us. So the next time you're navigating the aisles of your favorite store or browsing an online marketplace, take a moment to appreciate the invisible dance of inventory management that brought those products to your fingertips. And remember, behind every successful product launch, every smoothly running supply chain, and every satisfied customer, there's a team of dedicated individuals who are working tirelessly to keep the inventory flowing. Here's to all the inventory management clerks, past, present, and future, who keep the world stocked and ready for anything. Until next time, happy inventorying, everyone.